Now what we're going to be doing today is going through the 10 basic steps of um, um, the 10 basic steps of how you lay out how, how you can lay out a beautiful garden yourself. And, and, and that's really looking from design right through the implementation. Okay. So now the number one thing to do is you've got, you've got the area you want to do. Don't take on too much. Like don't try to do the front yard and the back yard once. Start off and, and pick out say the front yard and the back yard, and and then look at it like like you're somebody fresh or new. Like not not like you see it every day. But look, you can stand. If you say you're doing front yard, stand right out the front on the road. That's the one we're starting to do. And then what you do is you look at it and you look at it. Fresh, like I've never looked at it before, and you see what is it that's ugly, what doesn't fit there, what doesn't work, and then you look for the assets the view, or some nice ornament, or some lovely hard landscaping, a nice rock wall, or something like that. And what you do is you make the list of the assets and the liabilities, the, the plus points, the negative points, and so with the, with the, with the negative points, it could be a ugly tree, or and, and some negative can be changed. I did a garden for the other day and the people had, it was a big garden and had a really short but enormous working cherry right in the middle of the front garden and it was a bit negative and my first thought was chop it down but then they were doing it quite a big garden on a tight budget so I said I showed them how they could trim it and train it and turn it into a tall working cherry. It was going to take them a couple of years to do it but um, it was a lovely established tree and and although it was too short and too fat for the situation it was in, it could be converted to being a nice tall weeping cherry. Mm. And I explained to them how to do it. I made that part of the plan. So I turned the negative into a positive. So, so, and that was the, when I first looked at it again, the biggest negative was this cherry that was just too short in the middle of a giant garden. And, um, and so not all negatives have to be chopped out. Sometimes they can be trim trained, they can be moved. Um, they could be enhanced, there's something you can do. But you look at the positive and negatives and you look at getting rid of the negatives or fixing the negatives so they're no longer negative. And then you look at your positive, which could be a beautiful stone wall or it could be a lovely view, and you work out how you could enhance and, 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 and make the most of the positive. So, so you really work to, so the first step is to identify the positives and work towards enhancing those positives. And then the second step is to is to work out how you're going to eliminate either by repair or by removal the, the, the negatives. Um, and then the next thing that I do is I look at the house and I let the house talk to me. Now houses seem to be quite willing to talk to you. Like you, you look at a house and, you, and it will tell you it wants to be a cottage garden. It will tell you it needs a, a slick modern garden or it's old fashioned, it's a very traditional garden or it needs a very formal garden to be described or some sort of fusion garden with a little bit of formal, a little bit of cottage. The, the house, houses seem to be able to talk. They, they, they seem to be able to tell you what they want. And so if you just sit there and look at it, it, the house will give you a bit of a lead on where to go and what to do. So after you've looked at the house and you've got that lead, the next thing that I reckon is um, is look at the look at things like where does the sun rise and fall? Um, is water going to pool somewhere? Um, is there is there a, a, a boggy section or is there going to be a boggy section in winter? Do you need to put in a bit of drainage or or is there an area if you don't really want to put in drainage, you don't have to have a bunch of the time or the energy to put in drainage, you want then identify a, a, a potentially boggy area and and then confine it's no good failing and putting your drainage into a boggy area or, or, or other things that require um, other things that require um, um, good drainage. Um, so what you what you do is you either provide the drainage or you plan to put plants in there that, that, that will take that situation. And it could be a very hot sunny situation or exposed to wind. So it's a matter of really understanding the situation and then laying down the parameters to do with drainage and bogginess and sun and wind and slope and all that sort of thing and, um, and shade. Um, and then and then choosing, choosing plants and, and working your design around making sure that the, that the garden is really going to work because you put the right plants in the right situation and um, and, and what you'll find is, is uh, like say for instance with um, hedging places you'll find that some hedges 
it's so common that you'll have a big tree on property or, or some big building or something like that that shades at one half of the hedge. And, um, and, and then the other end of the hedge will be hot and sunny. Now, some hedges love hot So, one second, Chris. I think we got a mal mic malfunction. Sorry guys, one second. Thank you, Cara. Can you hear me well? Right. Should be good. good okay. Try again. So basically, you check out the situation, sun, shade, wind, um, and, and, and plan the right place. And, and, and the sort of things that that I would think about with the gardeners are the same for instance a lot of people have a situation where they have a big building with a tree that shades one end of where they put in a hedge or a screen and at the other end will be hot and sunny. Now some hedges and screens love the shade, some love the sun and then there's a lesser amount that will grow happily in hot sun or shade. Like English box for instance, hot sun no problem, deep shade no problem, no sun at all, no worries. Um, yeah. Thank you, Cara. Should be better now. Yeah. So, so sometimes the sort of thing you have to take into account is sometimes you'll have a situation where you'll have a big building or you'll have a, um, a big tree that shades part of where you're putting the hedge. And one end of the hedge will be put in deep shade and the other end will be in hot sun. And so what you have to do is you have to select a, um, a plant. You have to select a plant that will grow in either with it that can thrive in sun or shade. And English box would be an example of a hedge that's completely happy in hot sun and deep shade. So um, so so that's they're the sort of things you have to deal with in terms of the conditions. Now um, then Oh. Alright, one second. Uh, yeah, we're having some problems. Give us one second guys. Could be better now, but here we go. You reckon you can hold that up? Like yeah, that? sure. Uh, yep. Okay. How's so, that how's that sound? Should be better. Maybe just try and hold it closer. To okay. No, it's okay. Yep. Right. Okay. Now. So, so we've worked out the conditions: drainage, sun, shade wind, exposure, all those sorts of deals. And now the next thing is that what most people don't realize is that within their neighborhood, people have spent millions of dollars on landscaping they've, 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 and they've been doing it for years. And so where... And, and, cool, and, thanks, Cara. And so rather than experimenting and, and, and going it alone and trying to work out yourself what's gonna work and what's not gonna work, what you can do is you can walk or drive around your neighborhood and look at what's thriving, look at what's struggling, look at look at gardens that are doing great, take note of what's in them. And because it's a, so basically in most neighborhoods, you've had a, a massive multi-million dollar experiment and, and it's, it's clear right there. And so instead of you spending years of, of experimentation and succeeding and failing, you can just Pick it up and drive around your neighbourhood, or walk around your neighbourhood for an hour or two, and become an expert on what does well in your area. Yeah, that's and that, that's in, that's invaluable. And and I do that sometimes when I have when I'm going to a difficult area. Like recently, I did a, a garden design mm. in Altona, mm. and it and it was in a spot where there was salty wind blowing in from the beach, and so. Um, I went and found all the nice gardens that were in the same sort of position mm. and I looked at what was doing well and what was not doing well and I was able to work out a sort of a successful formula to, 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 to succeed in that particular garden. Mm. And, and so, so, and that's the value, that's the value, whereas I otherwise w would have just been experimenting and, and you really could come a cropper, you could plant something that you could be wrong and mm. you could come a cropper. Yeah. But uh, so so walking the neighbourhood is um, is a really an important part of doing. Cool. Well, what do you guys think about that? What what thrives well in your area? And what what area are you guys from? Anyway, 
let's proceed and if anybody yeah. has questions we'll answer them as we go yeah the next the next thing that i would normally be discussing with a person is the application of the garden is it a place for children to play um is it a, a place where you're wanting to look fabulous from the street is it a place where you want to sit out and have a cup of tea um actually i i um i just designed a garden for a lady and it's a buddhist prayer garden and she wants people to come in and 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 pray to to buddha in in this garden and she wants a, and she wanted a, a feeling of tranquility and a special feeling in that garden so, so every garden's different and so what and what you do is you you look at low maintenance or you look at like um people want color they want a place to relax they want a place like a, a, i did a garden for a chap on the weekend and he um he wanted his dog to have a good time in the garden. He wanted his dog to explore and that. So he sort of went kind of bushy and a bit rugged because mm. he had a big dog. Mm. And um, so, and what you do is you prioritize the thing. Like is like a lot of people are say time poor and their number one concern in uh -huh. the garden is low maintenance because they don't have a lot of time to work in the garden. Uh -huh. And so you, what I do is I'm talking to the customer and, and you feel out that the number one thing is is low maintenance or the number one thing is street appeal and so you put that number one and then number two or number three might then become low maintenance so yeah. so so with that you your emphasis on street appeal and and that's your number one priority but you have low maintenance as a as a lesser priority so so and with every with every person different like that the lady doing the prayer garden she wanted fairly low maintenance mm. Um, and and she also wanted it to be quite ec she wanted something that was big and bushy and quite economical so yeah. so we prioritized those things and, and she was really happy with it yeah. with the end result that's funny because it's good that you prioritize the functionality of it first rather than the style and whatnot because you can build around the functionality first yeah yeah that's right yeah so and and, and what's important is to prioritize it so you don't you don't make super important one of the lesser important things. You make mm. the number one thing, like that the lady with the prayer garden, she wanted peace and tranquility. So that was the number one uh. the number one thing in the design. Um, then the next thing is just before you proceed, Chris. Yeah. Kara said we are building in Clyde. It's a new estate, so there is nothing to base it off just yet. So what what would you recommend in a situation like that? Because I mm. think that's an interesting question. Okay, it is an interesting. Uh, Clyde actually has um, um, sandy soils are really good. There's re in Clyde, you'll find really good market gardening sandy soils, and you'll also find horrible clay. And so, I would check out um, where the sand and where the clay is, work out what you've got, and then look at another estate that would be similar. And then you've got that experiment to work on. Okay. And cool. and and so, and but you've got to match up on the soil because right. some of the best soils in Melbourne are in Clyde, and some of the ugliest. Right. Yeah. So the same idea, but on a bigger scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and and a similar a similar neighbourhood within a kilometre or two of you, you might be in a new estate, but within a kilometre or two, two of you, there'll be an estate with either sandy or clay soil. Yeah. Um, that you can um, go through and 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 have that learning experience. Cool. All right. We'll maybe do some scouting, Kara. Sounds yeah. good. And Yaz said, I'm planning on uh, a garden in a brand new area of Perth. So right, I guess it's the same kind of thing, right? Yeah, it is. It look, look for something similar. Um, look for, look for something similar where you can scout it and and work out what's what. Yeah, cool. All right, all right. On to the next. No worries, Kara. Happy to help. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so the next thing, the next thing is having having done all of these things. It's defining your garden style. So you you really got to decide having prioritized it, having worked out the conditions and everything like that, having spoken to your house and got the answer from your house as to what sort of garden your house wants, you would then decide that you wanted to do something modern, something, and, and I, I, look, I, I, I tend to mix things up. Like I'll do, you, you can make up your own garden style. Like you can say, I want, I love cottage, but I love native plants. So let's do a, a native cottage garden. Or you could say, um, you say, I want it modern, but I want a bit of Zen in it. So you kind of like, so, so you can, you, and, and for lots of people, I have to fuse the garden styles to kind of achieve exactly what it is that they want. Yeah. Um, so, so, so don't be afraid to sort of yeah. 
do two different ones blended together. Because there is flexibility within those. Oh, yeah. 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 There's yeah, enormous. There uh, well, I, I actually feel that um, garden design mm. is an area um, like there's a, in our society, a lot of things are not free anymore, like not, not free in the sense of that you have to do this, you have to do that. But garden design, to, for most people and in most situations, there's enormous freedom. You can pretty much have and do what you want. And, it's, yeah. and, and so it's good to explore that freedom and, and yeah. you can blend styles. You can yeah, blend right. styles together. Yeah. Okay. And Yaz said um, she'd love to hear what plants could make a modern native garden. Right, okay. That, that's an easy one. Um, there's what, what it was, when I was young, um, they people native nurseries sprang up but just at about the time i left school they sprang up and boom and they sold kind of stuff that they got out of the bush basically and and people used to plant those gardens and there'd be some nice flowers and some nice leaves but within within a couple of years they'd have a, a three to five meter jungle around their house and they couldn't see or see anything they just had a little track up to the front door and 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 they were basically living in in sort of scrub and um but what's great is that since then, um, and many of those same people have gone on and they've they've bred native plants, they've selected native plants, and now you've got, like, I'll give you a few examples of things that you've got more colour and, and you've got more clearly defined shape. Um, and so the sort of things that that look great and, and, and don't, don't turn into sort of five metre tall scrub overnight um, would be things like your cousin it, uh, your cousin it plant that's a beautiful um, beautiful sort of strappy prostrate plant that'll fall over a bank or cover an area and, and it has as well as being flat it also has little green mounds on it and another one that's super duper popular and goes really well with the cousin it is is your lime lava which is a beautiful soft green and 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 it has a it, when often I'll be walking around the nursery on a weekend when we're busy and there'll be a child down there patting the lime larvas like they're a little dog or something. Mm -hmm. And um, so lime and lime larva has that sort of pat me kind of feel to it, but also has a very definite shape. And then you've got you've got things like um, acacia lime magic, which is a weeping tree that grows up and sort of cascades down with beautiful golden foliage, and it loves a trim. So that you can you can keep that you can have quite a small courtyard or quite a small garden. And although they'll grow quite quite big if you let them, with, with regular trimming, you can have a beautiful, small, weeping, golden, evergreen tree. And then another one in that same vein would be, say, an Agonis burgundy. And your Agonis burgundy has uh, purple new growth. And with a bit of a trim, that can be kept really quite small. And so you can... And then there's lots and lots of beautiful little things like Brachyscombe is fantastic. Digger's Speedwell, they're all lovely small plants. And lots and little... There's... a uh, Orthrosanthus, which is your little native lily that has nice purple flowers. So there's lots of lots of small things and, and beautiful little low grown grevilleas that only grow 30 or 50 centimeters tall. So there's lots of things that you can plant that where you where you're going to end up with a with a and the way to do a modern garden is to is to pick out instead of going in in I've been doing quite a few modern native gardens lately. And instead of coming in, people who are really into natives and sort of want a collection will come in and in their front yard, they'll put 35 different sorts of natives. And that create, that would be interesting for a person who wanted a native collection, but from a, a modern garden design point of view, yeah. it's a bit of a mishmash. Yeah. But so when, I, when I've been doing modern native gardens, I've been going around and I've, I, I maybe only get one type of feature tree. Yeah. And then then I'll pick out five different plants yeah. and we'll repetitively plant them and we'll get much more of a sort of a feeling and a style and nice yeah. repeating color and co color and texture contrast. Yeah. So that would, so, so I guess it's a matter of really choosing your five plants and your feature tree or two different feature trees at the most, and then, and then using them in a way that's sort of smart and stylish. And then yeah. you got your modern native garden. Yeah. Cause the repetition and mass planting is in line with the contemporary style of modern. Yeah. 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 So that's how you can have both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I like what you uh, I like the acacia you put in that couple's garden the other day. Yeah. 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 That, 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 that one as well. Is that yeah. a native? Yeah, it's a native. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's a native, but it's not it's not a native that you'll find in the wild. It's it's what 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 you're finding now is that um, 
that lots of natives have been bred to be more compact, have a definite shape and things like that. They're still natives, but they've been hybridized and bred and selected. Okay. And that's why you can do, like 30 or 40 years ago, you couldn't really do a nice stylish native garden, but today you can. Okay. And and what the hybridizing is better for like homes and gardens? and. Uh, well, yeah, what it is, is that some, some natives tend to sprawl or grow really big and so what what what's happened is okay. that um and a lot of a lot of when you go in the bush a lot of the plants are just a plain green so what what they've done is they've bred color and shape and texture and 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 smallness into a lot of natives so that you can within a small with like these days a lot of front gardens are quite small so within that small front garden you can design a beautiful modern or cottage style native garden that can have quite a lot of plants in it and it's not going to turn into the sort of jungle that we used to get 30 or 40 years ago right, when we planted okay. up a native garden so they right so the modifying is bringing them back yeah make yeah. a bit more pet sized yeah okay cool all right uh what's up next uh, right so um Right, so the next thing the next thing that I do is I create a palette. And in creating a palette, what the idea of that is I go through with the customer and I make sure I don't, like some pe some garden designers say, look, you must put these here because they're in fashion or you must put this here because it's exactly the right plant. I think that we have enough of a range of plants at our disposal that I don't have to put any plant there that a person doesn't like. So what I do is I, I choose plants that I think will do the job that, and, and, and then for various reasons, the odd plant, the customer might say, look, I hate purple or whatever. And so I make, so what I do is I create what I call my palette. And, and so I, I, I choose, I, or help the customer really choose the plants that, that I think will do the job and that, that, that they agree or like. And, um, and I, I don't think you should put a single plant into a garden that the customer doesn't like. I think you should only choose plants that the customers like and um and then and then and have all of and there's enough range of plants now that you can have a screen or you can have flowers or you can have um ground covers or, or or climbers or whatever you want you can have and 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 you don't have to enforce anything on the customer you can have a customer liking every single plant so so having chosen the plants and all plants that the customer likes i then i then start to compose the garden and how i do that is that I'll pick out the first thing that goes in will be if I've got a feature tree or two or three feature trees I'll put in the feature trees and then I, I classify them and then I say well these other ones here like for instance say I was doing um, I might use a gonus burgundy as my feature tree in a small front garden which is a sort of a nice purple weeping tree that that can be kept at a moderate size with a bit of prune and then my secondary feature could be something like a Banksia birthday candles which is just a low wide very small little tree and so then what I'd do is I'd place my Agonis burgundy first and then I'd place my secondary feature or, or if it's a big garden there might be four or five big ones and then you know then I put my secondary ones in and then I start to put in my third main plants and I'm, I'm coming down in size and down in importance in terms of their, their role and then what I'll tend to do is say for instance say I was planting three it was a biggish garden and I was, I was putting three birthday candles in and then I decided that I wanted to put um, something like a compact um, yellow buttons, which has a nice silvery foliage and yellow leaves. And I and I might put that in front of the the one of the banks is. I would then put another one in front of each of the banks is. So that and then I build up my patterns so that I was repeating repeating the same patterns, not always exactly to the front, but sort of the, in close proximity. You put the same sort of things. And you and you build the whole garden as a continuous repetition of particular contrasts and patterns and things like that. And often, what happens and and what happens is people may not even realise it might just look like a garden full of plants to them. But the on I think on a subconscious level they pick up the patterns and the and the combinations that relate to each other, mm. and and they get a sort of a, a visual pleasure out of it without even really knowing what you've done if you've done it right. Yeah. It looks looks a little bit more natural and yeah and relaxed yeah. doesn't yeah. it? yeah well that's right in yeah. nature you'll find that particular combinations are often repeated so yeah. repeating those same combinations is a is a is a way of creating a sort of like a 
a subconscious level. Um, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, by not abiding by such stiff or, you know, um, consistent patterns, then it won't look so yeah. stern and, yeah. Yeah. Stiff as such. All right, cool. Next point. Right. And then, so that's, so we're, we're now laying out the garden. Now, the next thing is you've, so you've, you've worked out your design, you've got, you've worked out your plants. Um, then you've got your actual site. So I go look at my actual site where I'm going to plant the garden mm -hmm. and say if it's covered with weeds, I would either spray the weeds with Roundup and leave it for 48 hours and mow them all down and, and start digging it over. Or if I didn't want to use a poison there, I'd get a garden fork and I'd fork out and comb all the weeds and rubbish and roots and stuff out of it, comb it all out and clean it right up and then, and then dig it over nice and deep and perhaps add a little bit of organic soil mix to it or a bit of good potting mix. And, and then you, and dug over, rake it over, clean all the rubbish out of it, you know, and, and you can use your rake like a comb and it's, uh, no, you rake your fork, you can use it like a comb and get the rubbish, clean it right up. And then finally use your actual rake, your steel rake and smooth and level and get it all ready. And you've mixed your good soil through it and then you're ready to plant. And then what I do is, um, if I'm planning to mulch, I won't mulch straight away. What I do is I'd plant, and when I plant, I would use Osmocote immediately underneath the plant. If it's native, use a native Osmocote, but I'd use it immediately under the plants and, and, and sort of like dig your hole, mix a bit of good, uh, like I'd dig a nice big hole, mix a bit of good potty mix in while, into the actual hole. So you've got some really good soil down nice and deep. And then I'd fill the hole up so there's lots of good soil under the plant. And then when I'm at the right level, put a little bit of Osmocote right where the roots of the plant are going to be. Put the plant on top and put a little bit of Osmocote right on top and then fill it around it and don't put the soil right on top. Now, if you're planning to mulch, I, I, I actually push the up into a little hill so that when the mulch goes in, the plant isn't being buried. And so, so you have the little hill with the mulch on it. And then I would tend, after I planted it all, I would tend to... Uh, broadcast a little bit of chemical soil water all over the garden. Chemical soil water helps with drainage. It helps it helps get the right amount of water in. When there's too much rain and too much water, it, it sort of regulates it. Mm. And when there's not enough, it helps it go in and stay in. So mm. so um, a bit of soil water is fantastic for, for establishing your garden. And then rather than using weed mat and rather than putting mulch on straight away, what I think is a great idea is, is, is to go buy yourself a nice sharp little hoe, just a small one, and then every two weeks from the time you plant it, go through and hoe the garden. Now, if you do it every two weeks, the weeds won't be any bigger than this and they'll be light and easy. The hoe will go through them without any physical effort and just, just don't clean the weeds up. Don't throw them in the rubbish, don't do anything. Just hoe it over and let them fall over and die where they are and just do that every two weeks. And what you'll find is that after a couple of months, you will have broken the back of the weeds. And once you've broken the back of the weeds and not much more weeds are germinating, then you can put your mulch on. And one of my favorite mulch would be a crushed pine bark because crushed pine bark rots away and contributes nicely to the soil. But for styling reasons, you might want to use a black mulch, even a pebble. Um, all of those things work well as mulch. The only mulch I really object to is your red mulch. I've never seen the red dyed timber mulch look good on anywhere it looks like yeah. it looks like radioactive waste it's to me stark, it? yeah it, it, and and so um sometimes you see houses done up for sale and they put the red mulch all around i think my god that's terrible you know you probably just devalued it by five thousand <laughs> bucks you know um so stick with it. black mulch looks good on almost any garden and there's there's other shales and 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 gravels and all sorts of things that you can use and crushed pine bark particularly a nice pine crushed pine crushed pine bark is really really nice and I did a garden the other day and it was a kind of like a, a nice smooth down timber, timber, like natural timber mulch. And it was designed for playgrounds for children to fall on. And it was a lovely soft stuff, really good. So, you know, like you, there's lots of things to you. And I think use anything except that red stuff. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, cool. And I think we're pretty much there. So, um, so cool. that's got your planting. You've used your Osmocote, you used a bit of potting mix. You've put the soil water down. Um, you've broken the back of the weeds and then you put your mulch on. If you put your mulch on the day that you plant the garden, you could get a big crop of weeds up, which could kind of ruin your mulch. Okay. Uh, cool. Excellent. All right. Hopefully everyone learned something good from that.
Have we got any questions? Yeah, we do have some back, some uh, backlog ones. We're going to get to those. Uh, radio. So, someone asked, um, larger gardens on one acre, planting on scale. So maybe right, garden okay. styles or plants yeah. you would recommend? When I was a kid, um, <clears throat> my parents planted up a five-acre garden. And it was all under my mum's direction, actually. <coughs> and what we did was that um, it started off with a, with a, with a garden that my dad had us has boys plant plants all over the all over in the lawn everywhere, and and he had terrible trouble getting us to mow the lawn because we had to go in between all these trees, and it took hours and hours, and you had to go slow, and it was really difficult. And so then my mum said, look, what you do is you mulch, you mulch large areas of the garden and plant your trees. And then in the front of that, we'll do shrubs and flowers and bulbs and things like that in front of the mulch area. And at the back, you can just grow all big trees. And then the, and in the lawn, you don't have anything. And so I've really stuck to that. And, and, and that turned out to be a wonderful garden. My parents kept it for years and years and years. It was really wonderful. And, and lovely big sweeping lawns. And then large mulched areas full of trees and shrubs and flowers and bulbs in the front. Um, so so um, the main thing, on an acre of land, I would tend to mass plant. I would tend to keep all my trees and that in large mulched areas. I try and design the whole garden so that at an acre, you really want to have a, a big mower or a right on mower. And I would design all the curves and all the openings and all the things like that so that they could be negotiated by a mower at speed. So like, like when I've designed big gardens for myself, um, I've thought, well, I'm mowing this with my tractor and I want to mow it in third gear. <laughs> and, uh, and, and because what it is, is that for some reason, it doesn't seem like a great thing to spend all day out there on the mower. And um, so, so I, I, de I designed my mulch areas and all my curves and things. And I try not to make little corners and spots where I can't get in with my machinery. So so on a big block, you should sort of think of having a big mower, a bit of machinery, whatever, and, and try and lessen your workload and make it, and, and then mass plant and have large mulched areas. Um, one garden that I did, I planted tr trees in clumps all over the garden. It was about an acre. I planted trees in clumps all over the garden and then around the house or just in front of the house I made a, and and because I have this belief that what determines how much gardening you have to do is how many garden beds you've got so what I did on this particular place a garden bed for flowers and bulbs and things like that I made only one garden bed on a whole block of almost an acre but that one garden bed would have been nearly 20 meters long and four meters wide and it had little pathways going through it so you get to the house and go down to the shed and, do, you know, and, and navigate all through it um, and stairs and things like that. But it was just one big garden bed. And so I had an enormous number of flowers and plants in there. But I didn't, I didn't feel it was overly burdensome to look after because it was just the one garden bed that I had. And there, then the rest, everything else on the property was just trees with mulch around them. And, and, um, and I found that as a large garden incredibly easy to look after. that answers that question um someone said best trees for driveways acreage borders um particularly if any evergreen varieties right okay actually i was just talking to a customer and driveways on a big property um there's a thing called an evergreen older which is also latin name is ulnus and evergreen olders uh, this chap said to, he's telling me he's, he's he's planting up his farm it's just in before he's planting up his farm and he said, sell me your fastest growing thing. And I thought, well, evergreen olders, evergreen olders, you can plant one quite small and get it up five metres in one year. And all you have to do, and it's a beautiful bushy thing, um, it looks a little bit like a silver birch. It has, a fine, it has the same shape leaf as a silver birch. It doesn't have the silver trunk. It's evergreen, and it's great up a driveway, great round the edges, really fast, really, really easy to grow. And like to get five metres in a year, you have to do certain things. What you have to do is have no grass or weeds, and you have to give them plenty of water whenever they want. You wouldn't let them want for water on a single day of the year. So plenty of water. So if you've got plenty of water um, and, and, and you keep the grass and weeds away, perhaps mulch around them or, and keep the no grass or weeds around the base, 
They can grow five metres in a year, you can have them up eight metres in two years and great round the border, great up the driveway. But say you had a, 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 a dry property you know, and you didn't, and you only had a bit of a bit of tank water. You didn't, you weren't able to provide massive amounts of water. A really good tree on a on on a tough property like that would be a claret ash. A claret ash is on a desert ash understock, and it is really really tough. You cannot kill them with dryness. And um, and what you could do if you planted a desert ash is you could water and fertilize and keep the grass and weeds away and get fabulous growth out of it for the first year or two then you could stop, cut the water and it would live there for the next 100 years. And they have beautiful autumn color, lovely bushy, upright, beautifully shaped tree. So that would be a great tree for a, a dry sort of a block. Okay, excellent. Alrighty. Um, what about plants that like wet feet? Pla well, if you had, if you're after small plants for wet great feet, Almost every grass, and that includes your bamboos and your nandinas, can almost live in swamps. Uh -huh. So, so, so grasses and nandinas. Then, apart from that, willows. And we've got like a, a small ornamental willow now called a nashiki willow. Um, and then your your evergreen alders that I was just talking about. They love to be flooded a couple of times a year. Love a boggy spot. So, so um, grasses, nandinas, bamboos, and and um, and Willows and evergreen alders all love to be in a bog. Okay, excellent. Uh, one more. Um, somebody asked for care and maintenance of plants. Chris's hot tips. Right. Very, very broad, isn't it? Care and maintenance of plants. My hot tips on care and maintenance of plants. Well, if you wanted really general rules. The University of California 30 years ago did a study on establishing ornamental plants and they said the different things you can do to improve the survival of newly planted plants is watering, fertilizing and weed control. And they said if you could only do one of those three things, the number one thing is, and it's quite surprising, you might think it was water, you might think it's fertilizer, if it's not, it's weed control. So if you wanted if you wanted a plant to grow, the number one most important thing is weed control. Grass and weed competition absolutely cripples most plants. And so so if you only could do one thing for your plant, like I had a woman complain that that some plants she bought off me didn't grow too good, and I went down there and she'd planted them just in a sea of grass and weeds, and then the, the grass and weeds grow up bigger than the plants, and they weren't they were just sitting there. And then she had a garden bed over in one corner and she'd plant it in there and all the plants were doing really good and you could just really see it. So so number one is, is that and then number two is probably watering and number three is probably fertilizing. Okay. Excellent. I will. Take care of your plants and they'll take care of you, I guess. Mm. Alrighty, I think that's it for all the questions today guys. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot. See you later. Goodbye, goodbye.